let's get our Bibles this morning and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. When you find your place, stand with me. It's John, chapter 3. I appreciate the Spirit of the Lord and uh, those good songs. I just love it when God ministers to our hearts. John, chapter number 3. We've been preaching through this gospel for uh, a little bit now, and I want us to return back to John chapter 3 and into this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And I, Just, just uh, for uh, sake of review, we'll start in uh, verse number 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. And so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and I thank you for blessing our hearts already in the time of worship, and I thank you for being God. Thank you for being the kind of God that loves sinners. Love sinners enough to send his son and die for their sin. Love sinners enough to adopt them and make them children. Love sinners enough to forgive us and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness and give us a home in heaven. Then to love us enough to help us through this life and to help us as we plod these roads and deal with these troubles and trials. And Lord, thank you for loving us in this life. I pray now as we... I have turned to your word, and we look at this wonderful conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Lord, I pray that you'll give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, help us behold wondrous things out of thy law. Help us see what we need to see. Help us see what you want us to see. Help us to hear what we need to hear. Lord, I pray that the wind will blow this morning. And I know we can't fabricate it and we can't start it. Lord, I pray that your wind will blow through here. Blow on these souls. Lord, if there's somebody here lost, I pray this morning that they would respond to the wind and be saved. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. So the last time we were together in John, we, we looked at Nicodemus. And the demand that Jesus gave for being born again. Now, Nicodemus was not just a regular man. Nicodemus was 
probably one of the most religious men in all of Israel. He was, a, in verse number one, a ruler of the Jews. And so he was not only one of the best Jews, he was in charge of the best Jews. He was a, a, a very religious man, a very moral man and respected man. But he still needed to be born again. And here comes one of the best representatives of all Israel, one of the best representatives of Judaism, and Jesus said, you must be born again. And religion can reform, but it cannot redeem. Amen. Adherence to traditions can reform, can, can straighten your life up, can make you a more respectable person, but it cannot do away with your sin nature. It cannot take away your sin. Only Jesus can do that. And religion may be able to reform, but it cannot redeem. And so Jesus looks at one of the most religious people to ever walk the earth and said, Ye must be born again. Now, Nicodemus asked two times in response, How can this be? How does that happen? And it's interesting to me, he never asked why. Why must I be born? He never asked why, he only asked how. I believe Nicodemus knew why. He had climbed to the top ladder of Judaism and found there was nothing up there. He knew why. He knew he needed something. He knew there was something about Jesus that was not true of himself. And he knew something was missing. It was, it was the how that he did not have. Now, I need you to remember exactly what we have just read. We have just read a conversation, a real conversation, a real interview between Jesus Christ and a very good man. We have just read an interview. Our, our culture knows a lot about interviews, and uh, maybe you're familiar with uh, old Larry King Live and how he would interview people and, and uh, ask questions and and this is an interview at night. Nicodemus has come to ask Jesus some hard questions about how can this be. And Jesus' words, he gives three stages of being lost. And Jesus' response to this very religious lost man, he, he gives three stages of being lost. In verse number 10, look at that with me, please. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? And verse number 11, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not. That first stage is knowest not. The second is receiving not. And then in verse number 12, if I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not. Amen. These three stages of being lost. Knowest not, receive not, and believe not. Today we're going to study Jesus' observation of a lost sinner. Now this lost sinner is not like the lost sinners you're familiar with in the New Testament. This lost sinner is not the lost sinner that was hanging on a cross next to Jesus being condemned for murder and thievery. This is not the lost sinner that was possessed with 2,000 demons there in Mark chapter 5. This is not the lost sinner that was uh, homeless on the side of the road. This was not a lost sinner that had been caught in adultery. This is a lost sinner that's the best looking lost sinner in Israel. If anyone else had walked by this conversation and looked into the room, they would have assumed Nicodemus, that fellow's going to heaven. If he ain't going to heaven, none of us are. Kind of how we would say it in today's terms. This man was a good man. This man was a moral man and an upright man. This man was a faithful man. Faithful to his family, faithful to his job, faithful to the synagogues, faithful to his heritage, faithful to his traditions, faithful to his lifestyle. This was a good man. But this man was a lost man. It's not an offensive thing to tell a good man he's lost. This is a very good person. Jesus is not upset because Nicodemus is a good person. Jesus just knows your religion has not done anything for you. It's made you a really good lost person. 
Nicodemus must be born again. Jesus looked beyond Nicodemus' religion and his reputation and his morality and his name and saw three things that made this man lost. He knew not, he received not, he believed not. In verse number 10, Jesus responds to Nicodemus' question and says, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? And Jesus started with Nicodemus where all sinners start. They don't know. Where they don't know. They don't know they're lost. They don't know Jesus Christ. They don't know the gospel. They, they don't know. And that's where Jesus began with Nicodemus. Art thou a master of Israel? And knowest not these things? A master of Israel, meaning he was a rabbi himself. Nicodemus had studied the law and studied the, the teachings and the traditions and the history. And he knew a lot of stuff. This was not an insult to his intelligence. This is a very smart man. This is a well-studied man and learned man, educated man. But he did not know the truth of being born again. This is where all sinners start, of not knowing. You say, well, what must I know? What did Nicodemus not know? Well, you have to know you can't fix this. Amen. You have to know you can't fix you. You can't fix it. You cannot save yourself. Amen. You can't do it. You can try. The world's full of that. You can try. You can adhere to rules and traditions. You can, you can try all the steps. You can try the programs. You can try all those things, but you can't fix you. You cannot get yourself into the kingdom of God. That's something that Jesus has to do. You have to know you can't fix it. In Romans 3 and verse 23 the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. That includes the real upstanding moral Nicodemus. You know who's talking to Nicodemus? A lost sinner. Uh, who's talking to Jesus? A lost sinner. He might have been the most, he might have been the most well-respected sinner, but he's still a sinner. And you've got to know that you're a sinner. You've got to know that you're not enough to get to heaven. You have to know that you're not on your way to heaven. You have to know that. Jesus looked at Nicodemus and said, Art thou a master of Israel? And knowest not these things. That lets us know that you can climb very high in the realm of academia and religion and still not know how to be saved. You can climb very high on a ladder of social standing and still not know how to be saved. He was a master of Israel. Isaiah 64 and verse number 6, this is something that Nicodemus would have been familiar with. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have Taking us away. Listen, I love you in Jesus' name, but you can't fix you. You can't do it. It's not about you being good enough to go to heaven. It's about being born again. It's not about you being faithful to church enough to go to heaven. It's not about you living a moral enough life to go to heaven or a clean enough life. That's not the answer. Nicodemus had all of that, and it didn't get him anywhere. He didn't. He didn't know. He didn't know. And if all your religious learning doesn't lead you to salvation in Jesus, then your religious learning is useless. If all of your religious learning, and if you have a degree in, in theology and in studies and all these things, if you could study the original languages and all of that good stuff, if, if all of that religious learning does not lead you to salvation in Jesus, then all of that learning is useless. 
Jesus himself said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He knew not. He didn't know. Nicodemus knew a lot of stuff, but he didn't know the most important thing. Nicodemus knew a lot of things, but he didn't know the most important thing. He, at stage one, he knoweth not. But then in verse number 11, Jesus continues, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye, say the next two words, receive not our witness. The second stage of being lost is not not knowing. It's not receiving. It's not receiving. You see, at this point, and by this time, Nicodemus has already heard. Nicodemus has already heard from Jesus. Jesus is not a stranger to him. Nicodemus declares in verse number 2 that he knows that he's a teacher come from God. He knows God is with him. Nicodemus had already heard enough to know. But he and the Pharisees would not receive. Nicodemus goes from stage 1 and verse 10 of not knowing. Now he's in stage 2 of not receiving. Now he is in the second stage of not receiving. And I'm afraid that a lot of America is not sitting on stage 1 but on stage 2. I'm afraid most of America, is, they're not sitting on stage one where they just don't know any better. They're sitting on stage two where they would not receive it. And while stage one is bad, it's not terminal. While it's a bad thing not to know, it's not terminal. Jesus is willing to teach any sinner the truth. But the stage that's dangerous is when it won't be received. When it won't be received. Verse number 11 Verily, verily. Y'all remember we talked about that a few weeks ago. Verily, verily. Twice verified. Doubly true. Verily, verily. I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. We speak. We've seen. We testify our witness. Who is Jesus grouping himself together with here? Some think it is his disciples. It is his it is the disciples that are that are that, that that are a part of this team, and that that there may be some uh, truth to that, but I don't think that's what Jesus is driving at. We speak, we testify, we know our witness. Who is Jesus grouping himself with? The Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Mind you, by this point, Jesus Christ has already been baptized. God the Father had already opened heaven and declared, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Ghost had already descended like a dove upon him. Colossians says that in Jesus dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God had sent Jesus. Jesus will say in just a moment, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus would testify over and over again how God sent him. You see, this whole thing with Jesus Christ was a team effort of the Godhead. And it is a grave and a dangerous thing to reject the truth from God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you cannot reject one without rejecting the others. If you would turn forward to John chapter number 8, let me try to explain what I mean. John chapter number 8, look in verse number 17. Jesus had made very bold claims of deity in the previous chapters. And the Pharisees had a big problem with that. They, they looked at it as blasphemy. Look with me as Jesus responds in John chapter 8 and verse number 17. Well, let's just pick up verse 15. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. See, when Jesus says we, he's always got God with him. 
And he says, hey, I am not alone. I'm not for I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Amen. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my Father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. So when Jesus looked at Nicodemus and he said, Ye receive not our witness and we testify, he is, he, is, he is attaching himself to the Godhead and this is a presentation of the Son of God by the Godhead to the lost world. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost have made this whole thing happen. They brought Christ into this world. This is a, this is a, a witness or testimony from the Godhead. And to reject that is to reject all three. Jesus, in this verse, drew a line in the sand, as it were. We speak, we know, we testify our witness. Ye receive not. Ye receive not. On one side, he drew we. On the other side, ye. And God knows which side you're on. God knows which side of the line that you're standing on. And they would not receive the witness. They would not receive the witness. And I wonder, once you have been told the truth from the word of God, would you receive it? Everyone wants to go to heaven, but everyone doesn't accept the directions. Everyone wants to go to heaven, but everyone does not accept the directions. Nicodemus had been taught that his adherence to the law and his own moral goodness could get him there. But good deeds are a dead-end road. Amen. Nicodemus had invested his life into this way. And it's a hard thing to hear that your life's work's not good enough. It's a hard thing to hear that every sacrifice you have made brought nothing. It's a hard thing to hear that 60 years of living this way are not enough. It's a hard thing to hear that though all Israel respects you, you're still not going to the kingdom of God. Amen. Hard thing to hear. And you may think, well, I've, but I'm a good person. I've never, never been arrested. Everyone in here can't say that, but several of you can. <laughs> never, never cheated on my spouse. Never beat my wife. Never stole, never done, never done this, and never done that. Never been, never been high on drugs, or never been an alcoholic, or you know, never done this and never done all that. Well, that's all fine and good. That makes that that's great. I'm glad for you, but that doesn't mean you're going to heaven. That doesn't mean that you're saved. That doesn't mean you're not a sinner. Your sins may not be on your skin. They may just all be bound up in your heart. Jesus looks at Nicodemus and says, you don't know this. You, you need to know this. But then he knew they wouldn't receive it. He knew they were rejecting it. And when you hear the truth, would you receive it? In verse number 12, as Jesus continues, he says, if I have told you earthly things, and ye say the words, believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Amen. This last stage, believing not, is a very dangerous, damning thing. To not believe in Jesus Christ. To not believe in Jesus Christ. You know, there is a difference between not knowing and not believing. There is a difference between not knowing and not believing. Jesus has answered Nicodemus and knows that he doesn't believe. Jesus has entertained Nicodemus' questions in this interview. And, and Jesus knows that Nicodemus at this moment does not know and he does not receive and he does not believe. He says, if I tell you earthly things, you don't believe. Why are you going to believe me if I tell you of heavenly things? 
Jesus had talked to him about the wind and the water, these earthly things. Jesus knew that Nicodemus did not believe him. Jesus basically said, there's no sense in continuing any further. There's no sense in me continuing to talk to you if you don't believe a word I say. If you don't believe me, why should I keep going? If you don't believe me, why should I keep telling you things? Verse number 13, Jesus gets bold here. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. No man hath ascended up into heaven. When I read that, as a student of the Old Testament, I'm like, wait a minute. I, I know some people that ascended up to heaven. Enoch, there in the book of Genesis. And then I know about Elijah that was carried up with a, with a chariot of fire up into heaven. Like, I, I, I know some people have gone to heaven. Jesus is not saying no man has gone to heaven. He is saying no man has worked his way up. No man has climbed the ladder to get there. No man has made his way to heaven. The only way to get into the kingdom of God is by God. He looks at Nicodemus and says, No man hath ascended up to heaven. You are standing at the top of the ladder of Judaism. You are the master of Israel. You are ruler of the Jews. You are at the top of the ladder. And you have climbed your highest, but you cannot climb your way to heaven. Jesus is not saying that no one has gone to heaven. He is saying that no one has ever worked their way there. No one's ever worked their way and climbed their way up to the kingdom of God. And while no man ever made his way up to God, God certainly made his way to man. <laughs> In verse number 13, he said, No man hath ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And Jesus says, you could not come to me, but I have come to you. You could not work your way and climb your way to heaven, but heaven has descended down to you. And he, as Jesus is standing looking at Nicodemus, he identifies, I'm not from here. I'm from heaven. He is God in the flesh. He is not of this world. The beautiful thing about this verse is the next verse means nothing without this one. In verse number 14, Jesus reaches down into the Old Testament to get an illustration to help Nicodemus out. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, it may seem like a strange and random story to us, but to Nicodemus, he would have been very familiar. It's a pretty substantial part of Jewish history. You remember that Israel was in bondage in Egypt, right? And then God raised up Moses and the plagues and delivered them out. They crossed the Red Sea. They went to Mount Sinai. They got the tables of stone, the commandments, and Aaron made the golden calf. God killed 3,000 people. It was a disaster. They, they get on their way as they're wandering through the wilderness and they're hungry and God starts to feed them with manna from heaven. How many of you remember that, that story? Well, as spoiled children often do, they got tired of that. They began to cry and murmur and complain and tell God they really wish they could just go back to Egypt because the food was better. Long story short, in Numbers chapter 21, Israel had grieved God to the point where he was punishing them with their, with their sin. And they sent some what they called fiery serpents. Now, that sounds terrifying, and the serpents were not actually on fire, but when they would bite someone, their venom was so toxic that it would basically set you on fire. You would have an immediate fever and would die very quickly if it was not treated. And so Israel had these infestation of fiery serpents, and people were getting sick and dying left and right. And Moses took a, 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 a brass serpent. They fashioned a, a serpent out of brass, and they, they put it on a pole. And, and God said, if you, if you lift this thing up, and whoever looks to it will be healed, and they will live. No matter how many times they have been bitten, no matter how close they are to death, no matter how high their fever was, whoever looks at this lifted up serpent will be healed. 
And they looked and lived. And the message was look and live. Look and live. And they would look to this serpent and be healed of their venom, of their disease. Moses did not put a, a dead uh, serpent. He did not put a dead one up. He put, he put, a, <laughs> he put a brass serpent up. One that, one that had no venom in it. <laughs> one that had no venom in it. had a completely different nature, you see. It had a totally different nature. And, and, and it, had, it had no poison. It had no venom. And it had no hatred. It had no death inside of it. And they, and they hung that on that pole. And they lifted it up. And every Jew that looked to it was healed of, of, their, of their plight. And so Jesus said, just like Moses lifted up that... <laughs> Just like Moses lifted up that serpent, even so must the Son of Man, the one that was in heaven and is now standing here talking to you, this, this one, he's going to be lifted up just like that. And, 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 and Jesus was, was made a propitiation for us. And he knew no sin, but he became sin for us. And it doesn't matter how bad of a sinner you are, if you look to the cross of Christ in faith, and your sins will be forgiven. Whether you are a religious leader like Nicodemus or a condemned, convicted felon like the thief on the cross Jesus Christ will forgive whoever <laughs> Jesus said I'll be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and Jesus was that sinless substitute in Romans chapter 8 he said what the law could not do <laughs> in that it was weak through the flesh it was too weak what Nicodemus had was good, but it was too weak. What Nicodemus had was good for building a clean moral life and a happy life and, and money and prestige and a good reputation, but it was too weak to get him into heaven. It was strong enough to get him in good standing with society, but it was too weak to get him into the kingdom of God. The law could not do it in that it was weak. So God, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. When they hung Jesus Christ up, they weren't crucifying Jesus' sin because he had none. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, he said, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In a couple of years, from this very moment, this nighttime talk with Nicodemus, Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross and lifted up. Amen. And verse number 15 is where business really begins to pick up. He said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. A master of Israel, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, or the worst sinner in town, whoever believes in Jesus can be saved. And have eternal life. Now, the sad part, Miss Leslie, could you come? The sad part is Nicodemus will leave this conversation just like he came. Lost. Nicodemus will leave this conversation just like he came. Lost. Many will come to church lost and leave church lost. Some may have come to church lost today. I wonder if you will leave lost. Now, in a few years, when Jesus was lifted up and crucified, Nicodemus had finally come to faith and shows his faith by showing up and later in the book of John to help bury Jesus Christ. Now, I know helping bury Jesus does not automatically mean that he was saved. And church history does tell us that Nicodemus had become a disciple of Jesus Christ. He was actually fired from the Pharisees, and kicked out of Jerusalem, separated from his family, and eventually murdered by an angry mob for his faith. Now, I have no way of knowing whether that's true. There's, there's just no way to know if that actually happened. All I do know is that on this night, a very religious lost man came to Jesus and left just like he came. And I wonder this morning, maybe you didn't know when you got here. Will you receive what you know now? Will you believe in Jesus Christ? 
his death and resurrection. What will you do with what Jesus has said to you today? Let's stand to our feet. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. She's singing a verse. This altar is open. God spoke to your heart. Would you?